Mapping has long been a tool in urban planning. You can see here the John Snow map of the infected cholera well in London in the Victorian era. But new technology like GIS, or Geographic Information Systems, combined with remote sensing and the ubiquity of app-based information and data in real time, has opened up a new frontier for collecting and using urban data in urban planning. New technology has also allowed for the integration of services and processes to better connect with the real-time needs of urban users, and allows planners to respond to challenges changes and problems faster and more flexibly. This might mean more intelligent traffic systems, more efficient distribution of city services and resources, and better understandings of who we, as urban dwellers, are, how we move, and what we need. Technology has also entered the sustainability discussion, as smart tech can also be greener, if it saves energy, for example. Smart city thinking has become mainstream, and Google's subsidiary company Sidewalk Lab is even rolling out an entire smart city from scratch in Toronto. In these three maps, you can see the clear link between original ethnographic mapping, this is the John Snow map showing the cholera epidemic in London, and the way that data and smartphones are integrating with mapping today in these two GIS displays on the right. But I think it's important to ask, at what cost does all this data collection happen? Urban theorists have charted the rise of the network society. That's what uh, Manuel Castells called it in 1996, the way that we are connected in new ways and in different forms at different scales. And what this new age of communication and data collection might mean for us as an urban society remains a critical question. Is it always utopian? Issues like privacy and surveillance, the breakdown of traditional social ties, and fast-changing political realities raise a lot of questions that are worth considering before we dive into a smart urban future entirely. Data can certainly improve cities, but what are the perils of collecting so much data? And who's collecting the data? Or what? What types of data? And how could that be used or misused? Movies like The Matrix or TV shows like Black Mirror ask these questions critically, the way that data and technology are changing our lives, sometimes for the worst. But the smart city is becoming a really popular, in fact, a dominant urban paradigm. The way that data can be integrated into processes like manufacturing or government, the way that Polls can be conducted, for example, new ways of getting planning information to people um, using smartphone technology, new forms of mobility, hooking people into the new economy through the use of the internet and data, the idea of smart citizens, giving people new ways of inputting and feeding into the planning process and the government process, new ways of building consensus, smart health, real health data that helps provide more efficient services and can increase public health more efficiently. Smart farming, smart buildings, a smart grid of electricity and utilities, both to provide greener utilities but also at more efficient cost to cities, and smart transportation, making transit systems more efficient. So all these things have a lot of possibilities. This is a map showing real-time bike crime data in San Francisco, and it's hard to argue that this is pretty useful. Maps like this, in which real-time bike crimes are geocoded and then displayed, can help users know where it's better to have a pretty strong bike lock. It can also help law enforcement quickly and more efficiently respond to crime. So the smart city is showing up in a lot of different areas, and there are a lot of potential applications for smart city processes. Smart energy, things like a smart grid of automation, that might be something as simple as knowing which street lights to illuminate and when. That can save energy, that can make sure that drivers have uh, street lights that are working, but if there's no cars on the road, those lights don't have to be on. Little things like that can actually save a lot of money and also they're greener. Real-time smart grid software. Smart transportation, ways of better integrating, for example, 
rideshare services, services like Uber and Lyft with public transit networks to help make public transit more accessible and run better, more efficiently. Smart water networks, which can be things like distributing water, but also responding to flooding and storms more effectively. Smart buildings. Again, buildings that know when it's appropriate to heat or cool, when lights should be on or off, windows that can adjust to provide shade and natural cooling. All these things are being integrated to make buildings smarter and greener and smart networks as well, as well as smart communication. So what this looks like when it's actually built is well, we can see what's happening in Toronto right now. Google, the technology company, has an urban planning subsidiary called Sidewalk Labs, and they are implementing a smart city called Keyside. You can see here it's on a Dockland in the city of Toronto. This is a plan, a sketch up of what uh, Keyside will include. And you can see it has things like self-driving shuttles, it has uh, what's called a passive house, affordable housing, a microgrid, generous public spaces, a utility channel, a high emphasis on pedestrian and bike networks to connect to the rest of Toronto. This is another sketch of what Keyside will look like, and you can see a separation of uh, smart vehicles above. Those are probably going to be self-driving or at least electric vehicles. The delivery vehicles are below in a tunnel, so they're actually separated from streets, which is uh, better for traffic and for pedestrians. You can see pedestrians, that's clearly part of this plan. You can see that trees and greenery are, are also part of the plan. The project is expected to house 5,000 people eventually and another 5,000 workers within three to four years. That's the stated goal. It aims to integrate technology wherever possible to create a more efficient and heavily automated urban environment. One of the innovations will be a sensor-based technology to manage crowds on a street, and that'll be a mix of self-driving personal vehicles, mass transit, bikes, and pedestrians, the way that they're going to integrate more safely and more efficiently. Here's where the critical questions come into the picture. In all this utopian vision for an integrated, green, pleasing to look at, efficient, effective, smart city, questions about privacy and surveillance need to be addressed. So uh, this is from a website called longroom.com. One of the people in charge of this project, a woman named Ann Kavukian, has quit her job because she has privacy fears of how the data will be collected. So I think to summarize, the smart city has a lot of potential, but we don't quite know what all that potential is. But certainly things like the better, more efficient, more equitable distribution of services, that's hard to argue with. That's a positive thing. If it does lead to cleaner and greener cities, that's also a positive thing. But will it lead to the mechanization of the labor force? Will that produce mass unemployment? And how can we deal with that? That's maybe a negative externality. What about the loss of human interface? Providing new ways of connecting on smartphones, of feeding into the government and planning process, that can be really good, but what happens if we lose the ability to connect face-to-face? -face? Is something being lost there? Will this produce new and faster ways of making money, of extracting capital? It certainly can improve how we connect, it can improve how services are provided, but it also makes it easier to make money. And what does that mean? And new ways of control and punishment. Even an interactive crime map, will that lead to things like pre-crime and hyper-surveillance? Indeed, planners like Oren Yiftakel have long been suspect of the way that planning can be both progressive and regressive at the same time. So Yiftakel would use perhaps this critique to talk about the smart city that it's possible that the smart city can progress planning in a forward direction and also it can regress planning uh, in a negative direction simultaneously. And planners are part of both of these processes, sometimes unknowingly.